Bring in show music, please. Hi, I'm CNBC producer Katie Kramer. Today on Squawk Pod. Russian election interference already underway, according to Microsoft. The company's former cyber policy chief, Chris Krebs, on the threat. It's not just the U.S. election. you got to remember, 24 and 25, they're going to be about 2 billion people to go out and vote worldwide. Amazon's secret stores on Walmart. The Wall Street Journal's uncovered the Intel operation of the world's largest online retailer. CNBC's Steve Kovac explains. Relentless.com, that was the original name for Amazon. They are relentless. Plus, reimposing sanctions on Venezuelan oil, protests and layoffs at Google, and the WNBA's top pick, Caitlin Clark. She has blasted away existing sports records, and she's getting a salary of under $80,000. We're diving into the gender gap in the sports business. You have a Caitlin Clark, or let's say the top three draft picks are arguably much more important to the future success of the WNBA than the median NBA rookie getting paid millions of dollars. It's Thursday, April 18th. Squawk Pod begins right now. Stand Andrew by in three, two, one. Q Andrew. Good morning and welcome to Squawk Box right here on CNBC. We are live at the NASDAQ market site in Times Square. I'm Andrew Ross Sorkin hanging out with John Ford and Mike Santoli this morning. They're both in for Joe and Becky who are off. We got a lot to get to and a lot to talk about. No, yeah. are we doing, we're not doing... Uh, multiple hands today, are we? Oh, yeah, we are. We're doing yeah. that plus. And how is this allowed to happen? It's like a manwich. I know. I mean, that is true. Yeah. That and is true. Like a Gen X manwich, too. It's like, let's empty the cabinets with the, with the Gen we, X we dudes. Gen X? Well, I certainly am core Gen X. Yes. Core Gen X? I yes, we are. Gen X, yeah. Yeah, we're just a few okay. months apart. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about oil. The Biden administration said it will not renew a license that had eased Venezuela oil sanctions. Instead, the U.S. Treasury Department said it issued a replacement license that takes effect today, giving companies 45 days to wind down their business and transactions in Venezuela's oil and gas sector. The U.S. says President Nicolas Maduro failed to meet election commitments that were a condition of the easing of sanctions last year. The impact of the move on energy market Crude prices uh, actually backing off again. They started that decline yesterday, down 1% WTI, uh, just a similar percentage in Brent. And this is actually kind of a tricky situation that the U.S. is trying to kind of navigate, not just with Venezuela. You want to kind of impose, uh, you know, your your sort of policy pressure on the regime, but you don't want to restrict the global supply of oil. Iran selling record amounts of oil, of course, as well, mostly to China. So, uh, you know, trying uh, to do two things at once that... uh, uh, not not seeming compatible. So. Got to keep that oil flowing, yeah. but it comes from places that you know can be a little kind sketchy. In the case sometimes. for a while, yeah, yeah. indeed. Micron Technology, meanwhile, expected to receive 6.1 billion dollars from the Chips Act to help pay for domestic factory projects. That's according to a Bloomberg report that says the money is going to be a mix of grants and loans, as much of this money has been up to this point. Micron has pledged to build as many as four factories in New York, plus one in Idaho. It has said those plans are contingent on CHIPS Act grants, tax credits, and local incentives. Of course, we were just out in Arizona with Intel. Similar, yeah. if, you, if, you, if you count the loans that they got as well, it's a much bigger number. We're including that here, potentially with Micron. And they're saying by the end of this year, that'll all be dispersed, right? All the CHIPS Act money? Yeah. I mean, they've been, the baby birds have been waiting with their mouths open for quite <laughs> right. a while now. Yeah. So but how quick can you build? It takes years, right? Years. It's three to five years you need to completely spin up um, uh, one of these fabs if you haven't right. broken ground, started already, and they're super secretive. You know, you Are can there some that broke ground there. knowing that they're getting the money? Yes. Right. And, and some of this is just how quickly can you build out multiple fabs? They have them staged, so maybe they'll right. start the work, but it's like, hey, it's only five jobs until you give me the money, and then it's 1,500. You know? So will we know, by the way, like 2028, will we know whether this is going to work or not? For whom? For, for America. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's going to work for America in the sense that you've got TSMC, Samsung, Intel, right. you know, so many global foundries, so many building out fabs. I think the question is how cost competitive are they going to be and at what process node? So is right. it going to be the most advanced chips right. doing AI? Are they going to be competitive with what TMC's got coming out of Taiwan? And, um, you know, I, I don't expect the geopolitical situation to change so much that nobody's worried about Asia anymore right. in 28. UBS is planning another round of job cuts following its rescue of Credit Suisse. That's according to a Bloomberg report that said the cuts are expected to affect more than 100 positions. And it goes beyond a routine pruning of underperformers of the sort that would happen uh, most years. 
Yeah, well, speaking of moving things around, yeah, Alphabet CFO Ruth Porat said yesterday the company's restructuring its finance organization. That move is going to include layoffs and reorganizations. Porat cited the, the platform shift to AI as part of the reason for the change. And separately, Google terminated 28 employees yesterday after a series of protests over the company's contract to provide the Israeli government and military with cloud computing and AI services. Some also said they were protesting the, quote, harassment, intimidation, bullying, silencing, and censorship of Palestinian, Arab, and Muslim Googlers. On Tuesday night, nine Google workers were arrested on trespassing charges after staging a sit-in at the company's offices in New York and Sunnyvale, California. In an email last night, a Google executive told workers that the 28 people fired were found to be involved in the protests that took over office spaces, defaced property, and impeded the work of other Googlers. There's a bit of a sit-in in the offices of Thomas Curry and the CEO of Google Cloud. Right. Um, Are you surprised that this is going on? No. I mean, California? Yeah. Which part? Which part's surprising? These are, I, I, these are, these are highly paid people mm -hmm. who are treating, I mean, Google has treat, been treated and treats itself, unfortunately, or has for a very long time, like a university, almost. A very, almost like an open campus where anything goes. Used to. But, but, not, but not no, but anymore. I was going to say, yeah. over the last several years, I yeah. think it's tried to limit that. And so that's why, to me, this kind of thing is surprising. Um, I, I think Google Cloud is more of an enterprise culture to begin with. And then I think there's, there's I'm hearing a lot of discontent from longtime Google employees about... Uh, not only how it's handling some internal development things around AI, but then about the culture, so, too. So you think that so. these 28 people basically knew going in they were going to get fired and they were basically prepared to quit, lose well, their job? Uh, maybe. I, I, I don't know specifically in this right. case, but you got to think about where Google's drawing from, too. I mean, these are idealistic, a lot of times people, you, you're drawing out, you know, some people coming in from Berkeley right. and whatnot, and, you know, they, they want to express how they feel. Now, even though you've got some layoffs, and we're talking about small numbers here, a lot of these folks are going to be able to find jobs in this job market. We know how tight things are. So hold it's on, not hold as on, if... hold on. That's actually even, interesting, even more interesting. Yeah. Would you hire somebody, would you hire somebody who was involved in a protest at Google and was one of the 28 fired? I am not sure you would hire that person because you wouldn't want that person doing, running a sitting in your company. Well, it depends on what kind of products you're selling, probably. Like if you're, if, if you're, you're a, a big river. Engineer, if you're a tech engineer. <laughs> if you're a big river shipping products out of, <laughs> if you're in. We're gonna talk about big river really at cool. Amazon for those who are. It, uh, is, it is nonetheless telling that Google was very specific in saying these were the grounds on which we dismissed these people. In yes, other words, you cannot, they impeded the workplace. It was not just a freedom of speech. It's not obviously cracking down on, on these political right. positions. So, you know, it shows you there's a sensitivity there to saying, I'm just we're saying, not telling you what to think. I'm just say. saying if one of those people yeah. applied for a job at your company as an engineer, assuming, would you take them? Or is this disqualifying? I, I really doubt for a lot of, now for some companies, absolutely. Like if, there, if it's an ideological, you know, clash with the CEO or with the board, sure. But I think, you know, if you're, if you're doing software for setting up a gambling app, or you know, a sports news site, or e-commerce. No, I'm saying you, you go from Google, I'm saying if you are Apple, Microsoft, Meta, you're a big tech company, Salesforce, a big, would you hire one of these people? Well, I think there are a lot of different kinds of companies hiring in the Valley that aren't those, those big people. tech names. Right. Yeah, so you gotta, okay. you gotta widen your scope. And there's a lot of money still flowing around to right. engineers, for sure, and even some sales and marketing positions if you got, if you got the contacts. Before we uh, head to a break, an update on in-office work. Truist Financial telling investment banking staff that they must be in office every weekday uh, starting in June. The current arrangement allowing investment bankers to work remotely one day per week. Uh, other employees at banks uh, working under a hybrid arrangement of three days per week in office will be required to come to the office four days per week starting this fall. So. I don't know. Steve Can you Cole. imagine coming you in imagine to the office five every days day? A week? We happen to come in five days a week. It just oh. happens to be the way. But thankful it's only five. Steve Cohen <laughs> says it's Steve Cohen says, you know, that he thinks we're moving to a four day work week and that there's a whole economy that's going to. Um, and we're already seeing it in terms of leisure uh, in Europe. In Europe. <laughs> Well, Europe, no, no, but he's, he's, you know, he's investing in golf, yeah. literally he's on the premise it, yeah. that there's going to be a, a, yeah. an extra day where you're going to have time to do other things. Oh, so we'll see whether it happens. On. I don't, 
You don't buy it? No, absolutely not. I mean, if you want to get ahead, I mean, working for Big River, you will never (laughs) be working a four-day week. You're working. For those who don't know what Big River is, we're going to talk about it in just a bit. It's a nice little tease. Yes. Because there's a fascinating secret that Amazon apparently has, according to the Wall Street Journal, and we will tell you. I'm supposed to read that right here. Okay. That's where you're going. I was teasing my own tease. Tease your own tease. Go for it. I was teasing my tease. It's, it's an Amazon secret effort to gather intelligence on its competitors. That, that is next. We'll actually tell you all about it later. Cheese will be next. And also coming up, Microsoft has found Russian election interference happening now. Chris Krebs now at Sentinel One, once the Department of Homeland Security, and at one point running Microsoft's cyber policy. Well, he says we all need to be vigilant. Ultimately, it's going to come down to us, you and me, and your viewers, that we can't be easy targets. We cannot be soft targets. They're really just trying to amplify a lot of the existing divisions that we already have. You're saying it's on us? I have to say, if it's on us, we've got problems. All that ahead, Squawk Pod will be right back. And we're back. You're watching Squawk Box on CNBC. I'm Andrew Ross Sorkin. Uh, John Ford is here. Mike Santoli is here. Joe and Becky are off today. We got a lot going on. We have been teasing this story uh, all morning. And for those of you who've woken up early and maybe already read your Wall Street Journal, you'll know where we're going. If you haven't, here it is. Amazon. Uh, apparently going to some great lengths to gather intel on its rivals. The Wall Street Journal reporting this morning that the Internet commerce giant set up a third party seller called Big River Services International, literally a separate company or arm, uh, not under the Amazon name, to sell products through marketplaces, not its own, but marketplaces like eBay, Shopify, Walmart and others in order to try to gather intelligence on competitors. Now, according to people familiar with Big River and documents viewed by the Wall Street Journal, the site uh, spawned from a 2000, or the plan, I should say, uh, uh, came from a 2015 uh, plan codenamed Project Curiosity. Uh, Big River used its sales across multiple countries to obtain pricing data, logistics information, payment services, and other details about rival e-commerce sites. I want to bring in our own Steve Kovac to bat around maybe some of the either I don't know if it's an ethical question, a moral question, a doesn't business seem, it question. It doesn't seem illegal, necessarily. Well, so that was my, so yeah. I, you, re, you read this. It's, it's deceitful, not it illegal. It seems like some kind of, clan, it, the, the piece makes it out as if it's this clandestine effort. Which it is. Uh, which it is. They have their own email addresses. It's not, they're not representing themselves as who they are. And, and there were some times where they go to conferences and, and things like this, and they would say they're from Big River. My question to you is, do we think, as Amazon seems to suggest in the article, their spokesman, that this is sort of like a normal course practice? Does Walmart, for example, is Walmart selling product on Amazon's marketplace as another company? Amazon in the piece, by the way, they kind of hint at that. They think right. Walmart is doing that. But this is like an extended version of maybe, let's go back to physical retail, like of Walmart maybe sending shoppers into a Target or right. yeah. vice versa. So that's okay. We have no problem with that. This is like an extended version of that. And it also speaks to these open marketplaces that we have so much trouble talking about uh, shrink and theft right. and, and fencing products on there. Anyone can just make an account. Even your biggest rival can right. just go in there, make an account and start selling stuff. This is a long, long game they're playing, though. They had to build up volume, more than 60% of the volume that Big River, Amazon is a Big River. I was going right? to say, they really <laughs> wanted to hide their you know, tracks. Right. They might, yeah. <laughs> so they could say, technically, we weren't hiding yeah. it. Um, 67%, I think the article says, of the traffic was actually running through Amazon because right. Walmart said, hey, you have to be a big seller on some other platforms first before you can sell on us. Right. So this is a really, like, long effort that they uh, had here, Amazon also a long river. But, but I think the real question is terms of service, right? How much deceit was necessary to do this? But then at the same time, in uh, a lot of research, you get a third party to do this and collect the data anyway. But right. it's mm-hmm. so expensive to do it at this scale that arguably, I guess, it would right. be difficult for some so extra part of it in off. terms of getting onto their marketplace and all the effort. That seemed to be the most sort of questionable piece of it. I am sure, I will say with almost 100% certainty that Walmart has set up, somebody there has tried to set up a Shopify account. 100%. Somebody has probably tried to sell some product on Amazon, which you can do, I mean, we can all do it. We can all do it right now if we wanted to. So that part doesn't really uh, make me crazy. The question is, you know, the Walmart piece of it, the FedEx piece of it. There's an an e-commerce 
Truman up- Show aspect of this, yeah, right? right? Where you're creating a whole reality for your competitor to sort of live inside right. without realizing that they're giving you the Is there any sense that they that they really learned or changed their own practices in a material way? It kind of, they kind of gloss over that yeah. a little bit in the Wall Street Journal story, so it's unclear. The one thing that stuck out too was uh, Flipkart, the Indian e-commerce right. company, they got in there just before Walmart took that stake in Flipkart as well. So that was kind of, who knows what they learned out of okay, that. Okay, so too. if you are Doug McMillan, Doug, if you're watching this morning, we're gonna talk about you. Should you kick off Big River from your... Only if you're not doing it yourself. Well, if Walmart's doing yeah, it right. itself, it would be a bad look. Well, you gotta reword your terms of service. And whatever the TOS is. Yeah, either way. But I think you also gotta think about the hoovering up of data from YouTube transcripts to train AI. It, there's yeah, right. all of this, right, trying to get the goods on your competitor, whether it's in e-commerce right. or whether it's in training your AI models, right. tech's doing it. Okay, do you give them any credit for being this is so, of Of course, ingenious. this is so Amazon. They're, they are, oh, relentless.com, that was the original name for Amazon. They are relentless, and it's this is. like they're unusual. I mean, look what, look what Apple does with suppliers, right? Oh, yeah. Look, th- this YouTube stuff. Right. We're talking about what, what OpenAI does. Like, it's in the culture, right? Shoot first, ask questions later. <laughs> New report from tech giant Microsoft revealing that Russian online efforts to sway the U.S. presidential election have kick-started and could spike in the coming months. Joining us right now is Chris Krebs, a Sentinel One chief public policy officer who served as director of Homeland Security as a, a cybersecurity and infrastructure security agency and ran U.S. cyber policy for Microsoft. Uh, we should say now works for a competitor of sorts to Microsoft. Is that fair to say, Chris? Yeah, absolutely. In the security segment. Yep. In the, in the security segment. So... When, when you look at this report and you look at what needs to be done, how much of this is a private sector issue, which is companies like Microsoft uh, need to change the way uh, they are working versus uh, what you think the government is supposed to be doing? Yeah, I think stepping back, there's been a couple reports recently on Russian, but also Chinese and Iranian influence. And it talks, th- these reports talk about both traditional media, social media, but also the increasing availability and impact of AI through information operations. Uh, you know, you got to give private sector credit, Microsoft, Google, and a handful of others that set up the tech accord to combat deceptive use of AI in the 24 elections. And I'm using that term uh, in the plural. It's not just the U.S. election. you got to remember 24 and 25, they are going to be about 2 billion, uh, 2 billion people to go out and vote worldwide. Uh, we are seeing some use of AI and the companies are stepping up and they're uh, disabling the use of some threat actors of using the platforms. OpenAI has been out there pretty public about it, as is Microsoft, Google and others. Uh, so that, I think that's the first step is is they, they need to be aware of what's happening across their, their platforms and across their models and uh, disrupting the use. Governments have to be much more, uh, I think, aggressive and out there in terms of identifying and sanctioning groups. But then ultimately, it's going to come down to us, you and me, uh, and, and your viewers, uh, that, that we can't be easy targets. We cannot be soft targets. They're really just trying to amplify a lot of the existing divisions that we already have. And uh, keep, keep cool heads, take a deep breath, and uh, go about your days. So I'm, I'm not really sure I understand what you're advocating for. You're, you're saying it's on us. I have to say, if it's on us, we've got, we've got problems. <laughs> hey, look, I think the fact that we're going to have a vote on aid to Ukraine today or over the weekend is a sign that maybe these uh, these efforts by the Russians to undermine U.S. support for Ukraine, while perhaps marginally effective uh, at the end, are, they're not achieving their strategic goals of disrupting Western support for Ukraine. Now, what about problems with Microsoft? I mean, just a few days ago, we were talking about uh, Microsoft's process lapses that uh, expose the government to hackers. Now, they're warning about uh, Russia's uh, designs on the election here, but to what extent is Microsoft even ready to deal with these issues? That's a separate issue, and this does get to the heart of uh, one of the challenges that Microsoft fa- is facing right now, is they're a, uh, you know, they're a conglomerate. They're across software, hardware, operating systems, cloud, security, AI now. Uh, they've got a lot of different balls in the air. And, you know, what, what we have been saying, is, as Andrew rightly pointed out, as a competitor in the security space, is focus on secure products, not security products. 
what we'd like to see and what the Cyber Safety Review Board uh, from the Department of Homeland Security recommended is they get back to basics on internal security controls and fix some of the culture issues. Actually, Amazon Web Services, Chris Betts, the CISO over there, had a great blog post yesterday about how a uh, AWS is approaching security. So there are things they can absolutely do to tighten up the ship internally. Uh, but at the same time, they do have some of these threat analysis capabilities globally on the disinformation space. You got Clint Watts over there, who's a, a regular uh, over on the MSNBC side. And uh, you know they, they have pretty deep insight, as does uh, folks like Mandy at my own Intel team at Sentinel Labs is tracking a, an actor known as Doppelganger. Uh, you know, we have to stay on top of these threats and, and keep information flowing and expose okay. these guys. Chris, we appreciate you talking to you this morning. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Next on Squawk Pod, the WNBA pay debate. The league's top draft pick, Caitlin Clark, will be making under $80,000 a year, while her counterpart in the men's league will make over $10 million. John Ford explores both sides of sports salaries. There are always going to be excuses for why it's okay to pay women so much less. 25 years ago, it was the women can't dunk, so the game isn't as exciting. I don't know if you've noticed, but now more women can dunk. 40% of revenue is shared with NBA players. 10% of revenue is shared with WNBA players. Yes. This is Squawk Pod. Here's Andrew Ross Sorkin. Up and Andrew, Q. College basketball star Caitlin Clark helping the women's NCAA championship ratings eclipse the men's for the first time. Now many fans are shocked to learn she's going to earn just under $77,000 salary in her rookie year at her WNBA, first WNBA season, while the top male NBA draft pick will make more than $10 million. So the question of our morning is Clark's pay fair. John Ford is here to weigh in, sir. What do you think? Yeah, Andrew, I don't like the difference in salaries here at all, but is the pay fair? Absolutely. I mean, athletes get paid based on money the league makes from ticket sales and ad revenue indirectly. And the unfortunate truth is the WNBA brings in a lot less money than the NBA. Now, that's going to change if there's longevity to the excitement players like Angel Reese and Caitlin Clark have brought to the women's game. But it's not going to change overnight. So the NBA has 30 teams each playing 82 games a season, bringing in $10 billion total in revenue. The WNBA has fewer than half the teams playing half as many games, bringing in around 2% of the sales, an estimated $200 million. That would be nice if we lived in a world where pay was based purely on talent. In that world, Brandon Uranowitz, who won the 2023 Tony Award for Best Actor in a Play, would get paid the same amount as Ryan Gosling, who played Ken in the Barbie movie last year. But Forbes estimates Gosling made $43 million in 2023, and I don't know what Uranowitz made, but it wasn't anywhere near that. And we don't call that unfair. We call it the difference between movies and plays. More people watch movies. And the good news, women's tennis has dramatically narrowed a pay gap that used to be just as wide. So buy a ticket to a WNBA game and watch them on TV. Maybe it'll change. Okay. So even if Caitlin Clark's popularity holds, does the WNBA have a fair shot at catching up? Well, Andrew. On the other hand, Caitlin Clark's starting pay isn't fair because the WNBA is set up to play second fiddle to the NBA. Unlike tennis, where the major men's and women's tournaments happen at the same time, in basketball, the WNBA season is designed to happen when the men aren't playing. It runs May 14th through September 19th this year, through the summer when nothing else but baseball gets played because sports viewership is the worst. Also, about half of WNBA team owners also own NBA teams. That makes some sense because of efficiencies. But I also get the feeling those owners are going to protect their NBA franchises at all costs rather than take risks that might grow the WNBA's audience at the men's expense. So there are always going to be excuses for why it's okay to pay women so much less. 25 years ago, it was the women can't dunk, so the game isn't as exciting. I don't know if you've noticed. But now more women can dunk. And the men's game is less about Jordan-esque drives to the basket and more about Steph Curry-like shots from beyond the arc, one of Caitlin Clark's specialties. So the WNBA owners can share a lot more revenues with the players. They can. They just haven't faced enough public pressure to do it. Maybe that's about to change. Okay. Um, let me just go two stats for you. Okay. So 40% of revenue is shared with NBA players. 10% of revenue is shared with WNBA players. Yes. 
Now, I can explain that by saying that still the WNBA, I don't believe, is actually making money. And B, if you had more money, the truth is that most teams would say that they want to get better facilities for training. They want to get charter airplanes. Most of these uh, players are still flying uh, commercially, oftentimes in coach. There's a lot of things you might do before you'd actually spend money. Uh, and you're sharing a completely different size of the pie. But does it seem fair? Yes, that's a, it's a good question. When you're working off a higher base of revenue, there's a lot more things you can do. There's a lot more money to share. But the question here is, if Elon Musk played for the WNBA, right, could he make well, $50 billion? And actually, to that point, um, you, know, you have a Caitlin Cook, or let's say the top three draft picks in right. this current draft coming off this massive wave of popularity in the college tournament um, are arguably much more important to the future success of the WNBA than the median NBA rookie getting paid millions of dollars, right, in terms of their uh, ability to, to broaden the game. It's a really exciting moment. You look at uh, w what happened with the NCAA this year, the fact that you've got so many female uh, basketball players who have rap careers, right. who, have, who are making fashion statements. Clearly, there's going to be endorsement heat oh, yeah. around this, and then maybe oh, that starts to bring others. And you can continue to think about this Right. With the On the Other Hand newsletter, you can just type in cnbc.com slash OTOH, get the full text of both arguments, and you can share. And that's Squawk Pod for today. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being here. Squawk Box is hosted by Joe Kernan, Becky Quick, and Andrew Ross Sorkin. Tune in weekday mornings on CNBC at 6 Eastern. Get the best of our TV show right into your ears when you follow Squawk Pod, wherever you get your podcasts. And vote for us in the Webbies. Today is the last day to show your support for our limited series podcast on Berkshire Hathaway longtime vice chair Charlie Munger. There's a link right in today's episode notes to vote. Click away. Support us. Thank you. That's it. We'll meet you right back here tomorrow. And we are clear. Thanks, guys. <laughs>